and he's going to be talking to you about iOS authentication methods. Enjoy. All right, thank you. Um, as you said, my name is David Schutz. I'm a senior consultant at Intrepidus Group, which, why did the screen just go black? No idea. Uh, senior consultant Intrepidus Group. We were bought a couple years ago by NCC Group, so we're actually sister companies with ISEC Partners and Montesano. Uh, we're certainly always interested in hiring people if you're curious. I've worked on app security, web testing, things like that. Uh, I'm also kind of a crypto puzzle geek, uh, frequent winner and author of puzzles. And I'm going to try putting this up here. It's precarious. Maybe we All right, we'll see if that works better. Uh, I also spent many years as a government contractor, so some of my philosophy, some of my outlook on security might be a little bit more paranoid than most, and that comes out a little bit in these slides, but I feel like I kind of justify, I feel like I've got a good reasoning behind a lot of my, my uh, strong stances, but if any, if any of this seems a little bit over the top to you, that might, that might be why. So quick agenda, we're going to talk about what we, we're going to talk about. There's millions of apps in the App Store. I wasn't sure if it was thousands or hundreds of thousands. I looked at some slide before uh, the talk, and it was millions. And most of those, they're standalone apps. They don't really do much with personal information. I mean, they might link to Twitter to, to tweet a, a high score in a game or something like that. But most of them, most photo editors I and mean, calculators aren't going to have credentials, stuff like that. But many of these apps also have very sensitive information that they access over the net from back-end servers, uh, banks, healthcare apps, work-related apps, things like uh, payroll management, uh, insurance plans, etc. Many of these will also have a web-based interface outside of the iOS app. And so, of course, if somebody's able to steal a credential from the, from the application, they might be able to use it on the website. And sometimes the, the websites, websites will even have additional features beyond what's available on the mobile app. So you might be able to do things there with a credential you steal from mobile that the legitimate user can't do on their phone anyway. So if, for example, you leave your phone unlocked and you lose it, an attacker might be able to directly extract credentials from the phone, which obviously would now, you, you've lost your password. Uh, they might be able to configure a proxy and install it and steal credentials intercepting them over the network. And of course, if it's a jailbroken device, then, then the person who got on your phone just, just got a jackpot. But even if it's not less lost or stolen, you know, they might be able to do man-in-the-middle attacks at the local Starbucks, things like that. So the big question I have was how exposed are most apps to this particular kind of attack. Uh, you know, basically, how are apps today generally authenticating to backend servers? Are they doing it well or not, et cetera? So that's where I came up with the idea of this quick survey. I and mean, you see these things sometimes tweeted on, online, little uh, reviews of, of one single sector or something like that. So I want to look at authentication across a broad range of different iOS apps. How do they authenticate to the backend service? Are they doing it well? Could they do anything better? Did I see anything exceptionally good or exceptionally bad, really cool stuff, really stupid things? And I saw a little bit of both. So how did I pick what apps to, to review? I mean, again, there's millions of apps. I'm not going to sit through the app store and look and say, well, that one looks like fun, that one's not. I'm on my fourth iPhone in six years. And over those six years, I've accumulated an awful lot of apps. I've got way more apps on my phone than I ever actually run, over 230 today. A lot of those are things I install for my kids before they got their own little iPods and stuff or our hand-me-down phones. And that's not even counting the, the, the various apps that I've deleted. Um, but I figured this would be a pretty good representative sample of apps in the App Store. Now, granted, it's, there's still apps that I've picked. It's not, a, it's not a purely random sample from a research standpoint. But just for the, for the purpose of, the, of this talk, I figured it was probably a good cross-section. So starting at 230 apps, I dropped in anything that obviously didn't do much with the network. That was over 100 apps. I don't remember exactly how many. Uh, I dropped anything that was doing only OS managed services, like thing, things like iCal or Game Center and stuff like that. I didn't really want to get deep into how the OS was protecting it. I w wanted to focus mostly on third-party apps. Uh, again, I, I ignored things like a game tweeting a high score. I ignored anything that's only authenticating to local network services, like I had an SSH client on there or a VNC client on there. I wasn't interested in looking at the security of SSH. Uh, and then it uh, turns out a bunch of my apps were anonymous. They didn't actually use user authentication, so I had to scratch them from the list. Uh, there's a few that I said, oh, I'm going to test this, so I actually don't have an account. And I didn't feel like creating a new account, so I <laughs> dropped those from the list. And then there's a couple that I couldn't find in the App Store, and I wasn't able to put them on the jailbroken phone, so I just skipped over those. 
in the end, it ended up with close to 50 applications. And once I got started, I realized there was about seven that I wasn't going to be able to easily test. They were ignoring the, the man in the middle proxy that I was using. They were using some other OS call to get to the network that wasn't proxy aware. And because I didn't have a, an awful lot of time, I didn't dig deeper into trying really hard to get, get to that network data. I just said, okay, I'll, I'll come back to that if I have time, and, and I didn't. In the long run, I actually ended up looking at about 40 apps, including bank apps, some healthcare apps, a bunch of different travel, you know, frequent flyer miles, travel management kind of things, um, some cloud storage stuff, a couple social networking apps. But I'm not gonna tell you which apps they were. Uh, I'm not here to endorse any given app security, especially based on the very narrow technical focus and very limited time I had with them. I'm not here to condemn any particular app, although there's a couple that I'd love to call out. Uh, I wasn't looking for any bugs or weaknesses in the apps themselves. It was just a high-level survey, only about an hour or so per app. Obviously, if this were a real application assessment, it would take a lot longer for every single app, and that's, that would be a year's worth of work, probably. So how did I go about doing this survey? I pretty much made four passes. I started off with a man-in-the-middle proxy. I used uh, Burp Suite Pro with an untrusted root certificate. So basically when the app goes out to talk to the internet, it goes through the proxy, the proxy says, oh yes, I'm Google, and here's my certificate to prove it. But the cert that it provides is not signed because I'm not Google. So it's, it's a bad cert, and most apps should put up a warning saying, hey, this is wrong, this isn't working. And so my first pass was just to see if any, any apps even cared, and most of them did. Uh, then I tried man in the middle proxy with a trusted cert, so the Port Swigger CA, Port Swigger makes burp. They've got a certificate authority that signs all the, the certificates that it dynamically generates for the man in the middle proxy. Install that on the phone, now all of a sudden they all trust it. This is where I did most of my work. And then once I was done collecting all the data, like a week later or so, I went through all the data again, reviewed all my logs, launched a bunch of the apps again just to make sure I wasn't missing anything. And I also tried relaunching them again with, with missing the CA search to see if anything changed. So what exactly was I looking for? I was looking for things like in the initial authentication, when you first log into an app, uh, how were the credentials passed to the backend service? Uh, and then as, as you're using the app, are the credentials passed every time with every request, or is there some kind of a session token that goes and gets stored and they send that instead? Uh, then I force quit all the apps and logged in again to see how it logged back in again. So now any tokens or anything would be out of memory. I wanted to see if it was doing anything different in that case. If it was resending the credentials that had been stored on the device or if it was, again, using a token. And then also, because there's a lot of things that, that I was just describing talk about storing credentials, I wanted to see how they were stored. Are they being stored safely? Are they actually storing the password? Is it just a token? Put a different way, I'm looking for a secure network, a secure login, a secure session, and secure storage. What I'm not looking for are specific flaws. I found a few weaknesses, and there was actually one app that was able to enumerate uh, personal information like phone numbers, addresses, uh, et cetera, from a service using just an email address. Uh, I have to verify that, run down it, make sure I wasn't confused, but it looks like I've, I've found a disclosable bug, so I'll have to work with a vendor on that one. Uh, it's always kind of fun when that just sort of happens by chance. Wasn't looking for server-side issues, wasn't looking into the application itself. Uh, certainly I saw a few things here and there that I said, oh, that's wrong, they shouldn't have done that, but I can't take note of it because I'm not going down that path. Uh, I mentioned that a couple of these I couldn't go farther because they kind of got stuck with one thing or another. I didn't have time to really go deep. There's a few apps that use some really interesting authentication that I'd love to really dig into, but I didn't have time. I couldn't actually disassemble the programs, reverse engineer, go in and do that. There were two apps that I had to drop because of that, just that complexity, but only two, so that's good. I've still, still looked at quite a few apps. Also didn't look at any kind of uh, follow-up authentication deeper in the application. So if you're in a shopping app, for example, and you, you, know, you do your shopping, you say, I want to buy this, and it prompts you for your, your service password again for whatever the, the shopping service is. I didn't look at that kind of authentication because that would have been going too deep and trying to figure out farther what's going in there in just too much time. Also, while I was looking at this, I found a couple of interesting things that I think might be good ideas for future talks. Probably not for me, but if anybody's interested. Uh, an awful lot of applications use some kind of third party, or in this case, even fourth party. I'm not sure how we want to define that. Uh, providers for things like analytics, app, app analytics. They launched the screen. They played 
this level of the game and solved it on the first try. They ask for this kind of help, things like that. And there's Crashlytics, there's Flurry, there's Hockey. Some of them are crash, uh, crash report collectors. Many apps even support more than one of these. So an interesting idea is to, to look into how those are being uh, sent in general. Is it secure? Because a lot of times when you get an app, you just think of the, about the relationship between you and the app provider. But there's this other person off the side that's getting some information about you as you use the app. And most people don't even think about the fact that that's there. Uh, and then, as I said, I ran into a few things here and there, just general application security. So it'd be kind of interesting to do a more interesting uh, search on those. So the general process, again, I've got an iPhone 5C running 8.1.2, 8 installed all the apps from the App Store. Only one of these apps was already on the phone. So all the rest of them were a fresh install. There were no remnants, no keychain entries, nothing for any of the apps on the phone. I installed a, uh, a jailbroken tweak to send uh, the NS log output from the apps into our log syslog so I could scan through that. Uh, then I interest updated everything with Burp Suite, <coughs> launch the app, collect the data, see what I'm looking at. Then I did some, some uh, storage reviews, looked in the keychain, looked in the sandbox, trying to find anything that, that was stored that shouldn't have been. Quick question. Yes. Uh, what tool did you use to jailbreak A1? Which tool did I use to jailbreak? Probably Pangu. I think that's the only one that's out there right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think Pangu is still the only, only game for, for jailbreaking 8.x at this point. But who knows if that'll change. I'm sorry? Okay, so there's another, there's another app out there that, that will break 8.1 as well, it sounds. All right, so uh, the first step again, I was looking at uh, just the CA certs, and this was focusing again on the, the secure network target. Uh, I'm looking about things like credential stealing attacks. If you're in a public Wi-Fi and somebody wants to man in the middle of your connection, they can get your creds out. Uh, or if you've left your device unlocked, they can install a, a cert uh, and get stuff from there. So, so the good design here, if an app is done, doing this well, they'll use TLS. And, and seriously, I mean, you've got to use TLS. Um, and if the certificate is untrusted, refuse the connection. So I want to see apps block a naive man in the middle, somebody who's just throwing up a proxy, not bothering to, to at least pretend to have a cert going. Um, if it's at all possible, it would be great if the app could refuse the connection if the certificate is unrecognized. Not untrusted, but if it doesn't know what cert that is. In, in short, if you can pin the cert, and that would be a way to block a man in the middle for any, any kind of trusted but malicious certificate. Why am I harping on TLS? It's, it's very important because most authentication methods today absolutely rely on it. If the TLS is compromised, you, meaning the attacker, wins something. And here's an interesting quote from a, a nice uh, blog post called OAuth2 Simplified. <clears throat> it's worth reading. The majority of developers' confusion and annoyance with OAuth 1.0 was due to the cryptographic requirements of signing requests with the client ID in secret. Losing the ability to easily copy and paste curl examples made it much more difficult to get started quickly. OAuth 2 recognizes this difficulty and replaces signatures with HTTPS for all communication between browsers, clients, and the API. Dynamic tokens confuse developers, so we'll rely on something that's less safe. Sounds like a great idea to me. Because TLS security is far from, from guaranteed. There, there have been plenty of CA compromises, plenty being two or three in the last couple of years, but still that's, that's not good. And there's, there are certainly CAs out there that are in root stores that we may not trust, that come from foreign governments we don't like, that comes from local governments we don't like, et cetera. Uh, there's also open SSL bugs. There's a bug in iOS in, I think it was July of 2011, that allowed you to create a cert for just any site you wanted. And it would, it would just open right up and take it. Uh, and then, of course, there's forced proxy work. I'm willing to bet that there's at least some people in this room who had their connections man in the middle on the plane and fake certs were being installed because that's the way that GoGo Wireless works. So you can't always trust TLS. Uh, I really think the opposite stance to what they said in, in the OAuth commentary before is, is required. Use TLS, yes, but don't rely on it. Always assume your communications can be intercepted and write your protocol with that in mind. But again, as I said before, I'm perhaps a little more paranoid than most. So again, the first pass when I walk through with, with no CA certificate on Burton. Of the 40 apps that I looked at, 38 failed with some kind of error, which was good. 
One app didn't care. It just soldiered right on using the, the bad cert. It didn't, didn't seem to notice that it was getting a TLS connection that was screwed up. And one didn't notice at all because it was all over HTTP. <clears throat> More interesting, these apps had a terrible user experience. And again, in addition to being sort of more paranoid than most, I'm also a little bit more literal than most, and I hate it when applications lie to me. A lot of these things said, there's a network error, or a few of them had a generic proxy error, which is actually accurate, but it, it was unhelpful. Quite a few said, try again later. A few said, check credentials, which is completely wrong. My credentials were just fine. It never got to the point where it could test it. Um, had a few apps that just gave a, a very useless uh, developer-specific message, NS URL error domain, only one app had a helpful message. Network connectivity may be poor. Thanks for your patience while we get this fixed. Oops, we're experiencing a number of technical difficulties within our app. We are actively working to resolve these issues and return the app to full functionality as soon as possible. That's complete bullshit. <laughs> because the problem with the app wasn't the servers, wasn't the people. There was nobody running around trying to fix it. I was mad, I was hacking my connection. They have no idea. Things like that drive me nuts. And look at these, I mean, they're, they're useless. They don't tell you a damn thing, and you think, if you're an end user, I mean, here, we'll, we'll dig into it. But most people are gonna look at that and say, oh, I don't know, this is broken. This one was great. This is the one that I liked. Cannot establish a secure sync connection. Exactly accurate, that's exactly what's happening. Please update the app or check for updates. That's a reasonable expectation. If, if it's not working, chances are pretty good that the cert on the device and the cert on the server are out of sync, you need to update your app. That's, that's a reasonable expectation. The chances that somebody's actually being man in the middle, pretty damn small. So I don't fault him for saying that. And then he explains why we even care. To protect your password, data, and privacy, we refuse to connect with reduced security. This is perfect. This is exactly what apps should be telling their users. It's the only one out of 40 that did that. And not only did this app yell at me because there was an untrusted cert, it even warned me when there was a trusted cert that it didn't recognize. This app used cert pinning, which was fantastic. It's a podcast player. Why the hell can a podcast player pin a cert and a bank app doesn't? I don't understand this. Anyway, major props to the developer. It's an independent developer, just a one-man shop. Major, major kudos to them for, for doing this properly. <clears throat> so, okay, so that was the first pass. That was just... That took me an hour. That was easy. And then I replaced, added the Portswigger CA cert to the device and ran through them again. And this is where it started to take time because now it's actually working. Now most of the apps aren't pinned. They're connecting. I have to actually look at the tra traffic and see what's going on. 34 of the apps worked just fine. Two appeared to be pinned, but I was able to bypass them using Snoopit, which does, you know, there's SSL kill switch or Snoopit. There's a bunch of different apps you can install on a jailbroken device, which will sneak into the device and find where the cert pinning activity happens and bypass that. So that was great, so I could work on those. One of them appeared to be pinned and I couldn't get around it. Another one appeared to be pinned and the error message that I was seeing in syslog implied that there was an issue with credentials and certs. Now, I don't know if it meant the cert with the credentials was missing or if it meant there's something with the credentials and I think it relates to certs. So I don't know if it was actually a, a pinning issue or if they actually use some kind of a PKI based certificate authentication for the, the actual credentials. Not quite sure which because I didn't, as I said, have the time to dig into that. So all told I was able to continue with an additional 36 apps plus the two from before that didn't, didn't give a damn about the bad uh, burp cert. So I got 38 apps that I can, that I can dig into. So now I'm back to my, my four sort of review targets. Now I'm looking at the, the secure login. What I'm worried about here is whether an attacker can, who has circumvented some of the other controls, uh, in particular the network controls, if they can steal the password from the network and then refuse it, reuse it elsewhere, like, like through the web interface. A good design is something where you're never storing or sending the password over the network. So even if I intercept it, I can't then turn around and use that credential on a web interface. It's best to be using some kind of token. Now, of course, if they steal the token, they can then copy that token to their own jailbroken device and just use their phone, but, or write scripts to suck down data. So it's still not perfect, but it, but it helps. Most applications pass the user ID and password in plain text over, over the TLS connection. 
Uh, the vast majority of those went through the post body in some kind of format <laughs> within, within the, the data. Uh, a handful of them went over HTTP headers. Two of them weren't even base64 encoded. So literally, I'm looking at the headers in, in Burp and say, you know, something, oh, look, there's a name. Oh, look, there's a password just right there. Two of them even went as part of the URL. One had user ID and the MD5 of the password in the URL, which means it's being captured by proxy logs. And of course, if it's MD5, you can possibly brute force that. Uh, of course, you have to know that it's MD5. Well, in this case, the, the string said something like password equals X, or user ID equals X, comma, MD5 underscore password equals Y. So, okay, I know it's an MD5 password. Um, but one of them had human readable plain text right there in the get request. So, boom, any, any uh, ACD proxy you're going through is probably logging that. Now your password is stored in some, some thing in var log somewhere. Uh, a few of these also had secondary credentials that were also passed over post data, answering security questions, two step pin verifications, things like that. I didn't really go too deep into how those worked. And there are all kinds of different formats. Uh, like I said, there, there's things where there's a user ID and password just in the, uh, so, sometimes the, I guess the top left there is uh, the standard URL post format. Uh, there's another one, there's, there's JSON. One of them had a great big XML blob. Uh, there's, there in the sort of middle on the right is the MD5 password equals something. Uh, username and password headers, it just had HTTP headers, it said username and said password. And then there at the bottom left is a long complicated OAuth authentication uh, HTTP header. So all kinds of different ways that the data is transferred back and forth. And I found a few apps that <coughs> took some steps to obfuscate it beyond just simple base64. Uh, there was, you know, things that used, that obviously used encryption that, that I know was encryption. Uh, things that probably were encryption, but I'm not positive because, again, I, didn't, I couldn't look too deep. There's a few that used some kind of binary data structure instead of a, a easily readable JSON. One was gzip compressible, like how easy binary, I couldn't understand what it was. Then I saw a header that said, you know, format instead of, you know, you are all encoded, it was gzip. So, oh, cool, that's gzip. Oh, look, there's a great big massive JSON structure inside the compressed. Uh, data blob. But this is only about five apps total out of the, the 40 or 38 apps that I'm looking at at this point. So most of them are very simple data just being passed over HTTP. Uh, there's one app that did something interesting. When you first log in, you, you give it your user ID, it sends the message off to the server, it says, okay, great, send me your password, and by the way, encrypt it with this key. So then you enter your password in the application, it takes it, encrypts it with the key the server just gives it, gave you, and sent it back out. So an attacker who just saw the second packet that sent out the password would be out of luck. Of course, if they're man in the middle, they probably saw the first part that gave the key. So it doesn't really give you too much, but it was still interesting. Um, there were two that appeared to be fully encrypted. Again, I'm not positive if they were or not. Uh, there's another one that actually sent a private key after login. So you did the, the back and forth uh, authentication just over JSON and stuff. But then it sent a private key back to you and all the subsequent communications had a public private key signature on it. So that was a very nice thing to see. I've had a few dumb things. Uh, the, the worst thing was autocorrecting the username field. Why the hell would you do that? If, you're, if your account name is anything close to user to, to an English word, you type in your word, you tap to the password field, you type in your password, you hit go, and you don't notice that the phone fixed your user ID to whatever the, thought the word was. So it took me five tries before I noticed it on one of these apps. Okay, so that was, and, and I'll have more detailed numbers in a little bit, by the way. So that was looking at the initial login. So now I'm looking at the sessions, whether the, the data that's sent back and forth as you're using the app continually is, is well and sec securely transmitted. You know, an attacker who's able to man in the middle, if they're, they're able to bypass the TLS controls, they can man in the middle, seal your credentials. What are they, what are they getting out of that? Uh, if it's a good design, there's some kind of revocable token. It would be nice if you could be, go to the website and say, hey, my phone was just lost, disable that one. So now an attacker who gets their phone if it's unlocked, they can't launch that app and do anything with it. Uh, it's also nice if you can use some kind of a dynamic token to prevent a replay attack. Uh, but there's an issue there where, so that every single request will have a different authentication token on it. So you couldn't take one that was used 10 minutes ago and use it with a new request. Uh, the problem there is that an attacker who's man in the middle of you could collect that request and not pass on to the server, just send back the request to the client saying, oh, that didn't work, try again. Now they've got a valid token that hasn't been used. Now they can send it off on their own. 
Uh, another even better would be to do that, but using some kind of signature that's tied to the request. So an attacker who does that could only resend the exact request that you were sending to begin with. They couldn't resend a different request using that valid token. So I'm calling this continued authentication. This is the session. So are, are the requests, how are the requests authenticated? Uh, two of the apps actually sent the password with every single request. So it didn't send a token. It was always sending your user ID password every single time. Most of them sent some kind of token. Many of them were some variant of OAuth, either OAuth 1.0 or OAuth 2. And the tokens went across in lots of different places. Some were URL parameters, which again, isn't really the best place to send them. Uh, a few were over a cookie. Several were over some kind of uh, HTTP header, either something custom or an authentication. Uh, a lot of them actually sent authentication basic, but then when you decoded the, the string, it wasn't user ID password, it was a long token or something like that. They were just reusing that header name. And a lot of them, obviously, I think most of them went over the post request body. Most of the tokens, I did a little bit of digging, I didn't really go too deep, but most of them decrypted, decoded to some kind of meaningless binary. Uh, there might have been meaning to it, I didn't grab 10,000s of them to do an entropy analysis. A few of them decoded to ASCII text. One of them was a base 64 encoding of a client ID, the user's UID, some long number, I couldn't figure out what it was, a one, a Unix uh, timestamp, and a zero. And then there are two dashes and a 16 byte number. So I'm betting that last bit was an MD5 block. So it might be possible if I could figure out what these numbers are to brute force a server side key and create your own tokens. Again, I'm not looking at server side vulnerabilities, but this is an example of where you might think you're being really clever when you make your token, but you're maybe not. I mean, you, there are certainly things you can do, hash extension attacks, stuff like that that you can go off to, uh, you can use to attack services or puzzles or things like that. Renewed authentication. So now we're, we've gone past sessions and now we're talking about what happens when you quit the app and start it again. Uh, a few of the apps sent the user ID and password again. They didn't send a token. Uh, most send a store token, but there were a few that actually asked the user for some number of credentials, either the, the password or sometimes the user ID and password both. I didn't look at token expiration times. A couple of these might have timed out in the week between my first two passes and this pass. Uh, some of them might time out after you know, two weeks or a month. Uh, I obviously wasn't going to spend a month checking these things. And of course, if you check it after a week, now you've got to check it the next time you have to check it after two weeks. And you, to, it, you can't really test that very easily without <laughs> reverse engineering the app. Almost all applications stored some level of credentials. And the big questions I had were, what were those credentials and how were they stored? And that, that'll be my next target. Uh, quick side digression, another app that I found did something interesting where if you click remember me, it didn't store your user ID on the device. It actually told the server, hey, he wants to be remembered. And the server said, okay, here's their user ID encrypted. And it's encrypted with a server side key that the client never sees. Uh, and then it also sends them a partial name, so like my ACC stars. So it's enough to look at a list and say, oh, that's the account I want, but it's not enough for an attacker to figure out what it is. On the other hand, if the account is DSC star, 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 it's probably a pretty good bet, if it's my phone, that the account name is D Schutz. So it doesn't necessarily help, but it'd be nice if you could just give it a nickname or something. Then when you log in, the app just sends the encrypted password and says, hey, this isn't a real user ID. Uh, this, is, this is an encrypted user ID. And the server decrypts it and moves on. So that's a, that's a nice trick to do, so you can store the user ID locally without it actually being stored on the device. Uh, as long as nobody compromises the server side key, you're good. So the last big target was secure storage. And here we're worried about attacks on an unlocked device, for example. Uh, you leave it at, at Starbucks, somebody hooks up a USB and dumps the sandboxes of all the apps and now they've got a lot of your credentials. Uh, for apps like this, if you're going to do it right, you should use the keychain. That's what it's designed for. Uh, small bits of data to put in there. Not, well, I say more on the next slide, but that, that's, that's where you're supposed to put this kind of thing. User IDs, passwords, tokens, they go in the keychain. They shouldn't go anywhere else within the application. It is the most secure location for storing the sense of data because it's hard to extract. You can't just simply hook in on USB and suck it out. You've got to either have a jailbroken device and now you can run apps on the device and, and review the keychain reasonably easily. Or you need to use the iTunes backup password, back, back up the phone, then you attack the backups on the, on the desktop side and you can extract the keychain that way, but that's a pain in the neck and not very easy. Certainly not something you're gonna do quickly if you don't know the password, 
So that, that's, again, why the keychain is where you're supposed to be putting these things. And I found a fair amount of information in there, eight usernames, 17 tokens, four passwords. Not a lot, but a fair amount. So some apps are making use of it, which was good. A lot of them stored user credentials on the file system, but then put like urban airship push notification logins or flurry analytics logins in the keychain. So they're protecting their analytics data, but they're not necessarily protecting yours. And that would have been a nice metric to track now that I'm saying that out loud. Uh, that's about it. So what kinds of less safe storage? The keychain is a good place. What's a bad place to store it? Well, the preferences file is a really lousy place to store this stuff. It's not encrypted. It's just a property list. It's right there in the sandbox. If you have an unencrypted device, unlocked device, you can just pull that right off and boom, there's your user ID, boom, there's their password. Almost half the app stored their username in preferences because you're using the username throughout the app. I, I understand that. But it's nice if you can put that somewhere else just so you don't give an attacker a leg up. Uh, one app did have the user's password right there in preferences. That's a bad thing. There's also uh, some locations that just sort of automatically get populated with sensitive information as the app runs. Uh, certain amounts of uh, HTTP data as the application runs and just uses the, the standard APIs, certain amounts of that data get cached to the device, some URLs, some header and post data. Uh, 11 uh, applications, I was able to find either a password or a token in the HTTP cache on, in, within the uh, app's sandbox. A uh, handful of uh, user IDs and tokens were found in cookie files. Uh, but then there's also several applications that had tokens and even one password stored in files that were stored in the library and documents folders in the sandbox. These aren't automatically created files. This is a developer going out of their way to create a file to store data rel relevant to the app, and in that file they specifically wrote the tokens or they specifically wrote the password. So they went out of their way to do something insecurely. Now, I didn't look to see whether these files had additional protections on them. They might have. But again, the, the correct place to store this is in the password file, so I would, or in the keychain. So I would still say that this is not the ideal uh, application design. So then after I did all that, I went back a few days later, did a third pass where I uh, went to see uh, all the apps have been quit. I started up a whole new burp session and I launched all the 38 apps again to see if anything had changed, to see if it was still authenticating about the same way. Uh, mostly I was just verifying all the findings that I had before. But it was also a, a chance to see, again, what a long delay between uses would do to authentication. And it was pretty much no significant change. And then I said, oh, I should try the, the CA cert again thing again. So I killed all the apps, removed the Portswigger CA from the device, launched them all again. They all behaved as before with all the same lousy TLS errors. A few of them looked like they were working because they were using cached data. Uh, one of them looked like it was working just fine. It gave me absolutely no warnings at all until I looked at that phone and I looked at my regular phone and I saw that my regular phone had a lot more data. And so I put the CA cert back in, refreshed on this side and all of a sudden a lot more data came in. So a lot of them were using locally cached information, but as soon as they tried to get out to the network, they wouldn't work. So it was nice to see that they were still broken. Uh, but I was really worried that there might have been a couple apps that only checked their certificate during the initial log and then everything else that just didn't care. That, I certainly could have seen that happen. I was happy to see that it didn't. All right, so. To summarize all the findings, and now we've got charts. For the TLS certificates, 34 apps refused to work with a bad man in the middle cert. That was good. One didn't care. That was bad. And one didn't even notice because it was using HTTP. That's very bad. Uh, four of them refused to use even a trusted cert. So there were four applications out of 40 that I started with uh, that were pinned. Uh, and that's, I think, a low number, unfortunately. But that's, it's not an industry standard yet, unfortunately. I'd like to see it be. The initial authentication, almost all of them sent some kind of plain text user ID and password over post data, JSON format or something like that. Uh, some of them were, were obfuscated, but I was able to figure out what they were. Some were obfuscated and probably encrypted. Uh, a couple went over URL parameters, which again is, is a bad thing. That's something we, we see, whenever we see that for a paying customer, we write that up and say, you, you, you can't do this. And seven sent over some kind of HTTP header. Really, there's no functional difference between the obfuscator non, or the post data, or the HTTP headers. The URL parameters is, is really the big thing. For continuous session authentication, three different apps sent the user ID and password with every single uh, connection which again, 
it isn't great because if you're intercepting the, the connection, uh, now you've got their, their credentials, now you can reuse those somewhere else. So that, that's definitely uh, a, bad, uh, a finding I would write out. Seven of them use, seem to use some kind of a, dy a dynamic token, an OAuth 1.0 or that PKI uh, sign request system. So those were tokens that were not reusable and were somehow tied to the request. So those were, those were very good. 28 of them use some kind of fixed token, which was essentially the same as a password once you've got it, because now you can just take that to another phone or, or script or something like that and reuse it. So it's not the credentials, but it's still a way into the app. So it works, but it's, it's not as secure as it could be. And these were all going over just different places. Uh, nine of them had, went through URL parameters, five went through the post body. At this point, most session credentials went over HTTP headers, uh, cookies, authentication headers, uh, a few other things like that. And then after quitting and restarting the app, I saw four that just sent the user ID and password straight off. 28 of them sent the stored token that it had. Five of them asked for the user to re-enter their password. And one asked for user ID and password. It didn't remember anything. Even though I went very hard, you know, very carefully, uh, I made sure any kind of remember me functionality was enabled in all the apps if they had it. This app had no way to remember you at all. So your user ID and password not stored at all. And then as for storage, that got all messed up. Uh, that really got messed up. <laughs> in the keychain, let's see if I can find the interesting things. Lots of places, uh, user IDs were stored lots of places. 11 of them were in the keychain, which is good. 14 of them were in preferences file, and then there's a scattering of them in the caches file and documents and library apps written by the application. Uh, the password, I only found five passwords in the keychain. Oh, I've lost some extra text, it was good to see, darn. Uh, there was five passwords stored in the keychain, but I also found one, two, four passwords not in the keychain. There were almost as many passwords stored insecurely as there were stored securely. And then for session tokens, 14 session tokens were found in the keychain, and if you add those numbers up, I think it's 27 session tokens were found elsewhere in the sandbox. Uh, you know, and eight of those were deliberate, you know, stored in some kind of uh, data file and documents or library. So more tokens were found stored insecurely on the file system than were put in the keychain. So some apps are using keychain, not nearly enough. Uh, and then in general, there was one really good warning for TLS, one encrypted user ID that was kind of neat, one encrypted password delivery that was probably more than one because again there's a couple of in positive how well they're encrypting and a couple that were that were using some kind of certificate based uh, session controls so what are some suggestions if you're if you're an app developer or if you're providing security advice to app developers things to to think about good ideas do better storage of the data do better leak management make sure everything that's sensitive is put in the keychain Try to avoid any kind of leakage to the cache files if you can. Uh, use unique tokens for things like session renewed authentication. <clears throat> the advantage of, of this approach, an attacker can't easily extract credentials from, from an unlocked device. So if you lose your phone in Starbucks and somebody picks it up and grabs it, they're not going to be able to suck all your stuff off that. Uh, and also, if you've got revocable tokens, the user can say, hey, I lost my phone and, and delete it from the website. Of course, you've got to do that for every single service you use, but it's a start. It's not perfect, though, because the initial authentication can still be intercepted. And of course, you can still intercept tokens and reuse them. So a better approach, and here I'm going to say hash. When I say hash, I'm really meaning something secure, but I'm not going to say pbkdf2 every single time because it's a lot of syllables. So here you would take some, some kind of hash of your password, store that on the device, store the same hash on the server. And then when you authenticate, you send the hash of the password and a nonce and a timestamp and hash all that together. And you get a token that's, that's unique to that session and doesn't include your password. So now your password is not stored on the device that can't be intercepted over the network. The token that's used to authenticate can't be reused. It's much more secure that way. Don't really see this being used much. Um, disadvantage of this, an attacker can intercept the request, return error to the app. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. So now they've, they've told you, no, that didn't work, try again, but they're still holding on to your unused token. They can then send that on to the application and maybe do a password reset or something like that. So they can still kind of move forward with that. So the next good step, if everybody gets a one-time token, 
where just like before I was talking, you know, hashing the password, uh, not in a timestamp, but then also do a hash of the request itself. So the JSON body or whatever you're putting down in the post data, take a hash of all that and munge all that together into the overall token. Now you've got something where tokens can't be reused. It can only be used with, with that individual app uh, or with that individual request. So you can't simply take a token, change a request to a password reset and, and pass it on to the server. Uh, so it's a fantastic approach. You can't reuse them. You can't forge or modify the token, the, the requests. But it's a lot more complicated. And as we saw before, if you can't just simply copy and paste a curl example, the developers aren't going to like it. I'm really hoping that guy was just, just being frustrated because that, that bothers me. So the weakness is it's more complicated and the server needs to remember re recent nonces. Now maybe if it just remembers the last five minutes worth of nonces for any user, there's not going to be a whole lot of those hopefully. But it's going to need to remember some number of them so that it can reject it if it's reused, but it's got to be a long enough time window so if there's a delay in the packet getting there of you know, 5, 10, 30 seconds, it will still work. If you want to go above and beyond, you can use the one-time tokens like I said before. Encrypt everything with a public key for the server. I didn't see anything doing quite this uh, that I could demonstrably prove. You know, if you control both sides of the equation, this is always my argument for cert pinning. You control the server, you control the client, why not pin? Well, just like this, you control the server, you control the client, do a public key for the server, and everything gets encrypted to that. That should be damn near impossible to intercept and, and decrypt. Uh, of course, with all of these, there's still the, the risk of extracting the keychain from, from the, the hash from the keychain. So in the highest level of security, don't even store the hash, don't store the password. That's what you saw on those few apps where I still had to enter a password or had to enter a user ID and password. For things like that, uh, you're, you're going to see that on banking apps and things like that where no matter what, it's just not going to re re uh, retain the password on the device. That, that's your highest and best security. Of course, even if you do all this and make the mobile app completely unbreakable, Ember is just going to shift to the web app, and it's a lot harder to put these kinds of features on web apps, unfortunately. <clears throat> also, I kind of glossed over some, some tricks there, you know, hashing of the hash with a nonce and a timestamp. There are specs out there that describe this very clearly. Oasis and SAML is a very interesting one. I have only encountered this once on an app. Uh, it confused the heck out of me at first before I realized just what was going on. And it used like a PBKDF2 with HMAX and 10,000 iterations to make a local hash, which presumably is also stored on the server. And every request had a specif specific nonce and a specific timestamp tied to that request, and it hashed. It was everything that, that I've said before. It was a fantastic thing. But it's SA what's SAML? It's Security Attestation Markup Language, I think is what it stands for, which ought to be a clue right there. It's a scary spec. It's big and ugly and complicated. The concept is simple, but if you want to implement it properly and you try to read the spec, oh my god. Uh, but that's a fantastic way to do it. There's OAuth 1.0, which was very similar in terms of signing requests and, and so on and so forth, but apparently people thought it was too complicated, so they moved to OAuth 2.0, which was greatly simplified, but just not quite as strong. So in conclusion, generally the apps I found were pretty good, but they could be better. Um, they weren't really, they certainly weren't excellent. They still had some issues. They didn't quite scare the hell out of me. There was one or two that, that almost did, and I might have to write them a note because I use those apps a lot. Um, but only 12 apps had, had what I would call, or 12 apps had only what I call minor issues. Only six apps had what I'm going to classify as a major issue. But not a single app had no issues at all, which is kind of interesting. But really, in, in a lot of cases, just a few simple fixes could kick most of these applications up a level. Again, it's not a complete assessment, so trying to assign a, a severity to these things is kind of a, a subjective. Um, but certainly, in a user ID stored insecurely, I'm, I'm harping on that, but that, that's kind of low. I will admit that that's not a really high level of vulnerability. There's usually lots of ways if you've got a user's user ID. But if you can store it securely, not give the attacker an, an extra leg up, that's, that's always great. Uh, not using certificate pinning, I'm calling this a low here just because it's not really accepted as something that you know, vendors, you know, we tell vendors, oh, you should cert pin. Like, yeah, but what are the risks? Once this becomes more accepted as something you should do, hopefully that will be more, uh, can be more relied upon for people to do, and we can call that a, a higher severity. But if, but if I had had that as a medium or high, then almost every app would have been, you know, listed as a major issue. Um, let's see, what do I have? Nine were passing, credentials or tokens in the URL. 
21, we're storing the tokens in securely. Two, it is two. Earlier I had a slide, I said three, it was two. Uh, two applications for sending credentials on every single request. I found the two apps, and this, these are ones that I'll call high. Two apps that ignored TLS, uh, certificate errors altogether, or just didn't use TLS at all. Those, those are certainly ones that are bad. And four, we're storing the password itself insecurely on the device. I call both of those high. So there's only a dozen apps that didn't have any medium or high, and there were no apps that had none of the above. Most, most of them, obviously, did, it was a cert pinning is the one that they had. Um, so the top five suggestions, use cert pinning. We rely on TLS. The spec, OAuth 2 spec says to rely on TLS. So do everything you can to make sure that it is actually reliable. If you don't do this thing, then it's not reliable. You can't rely on it if you're not doing things like cert pinning or taking those extra steps to make sure that you really believe that this trusted connection is trusted. Store the credentials only in the keychain, especially for passwords and, and tokens. Uh, if possible, avoid storing the user ID that I should have said. Uh, but that's not always the case. Always use strong hash generation. Again, things like pbkdf2 if you're going to be expanding passwords into something obscure and, and difficult to read. Uh, hmax and things like that, stuff that isn't subject to hash extension attacks. Take steps to avoid leakage into the automatic caches and cookie files and so on and so forth. Um, and if possible, use one-time tokens that can't be replayed. Even better, tie those to the request. Those are really the five things, kind of in ascending order of uh, complexity. But doing anything from this list will definitely kick, kick an application security up a level. Future work, if anybody's interested in, in talk ideas, uh, like I said, it'd be uh, interesting to do a, more, uh, a wider survey, do a more formal cross-section. Uh, like I said before, the, the apps that I chose were self-selected. They were the apps that happened to be on my phone the day I started doing this. Uh, it would be interesting to do a, a more formal, broader selection of applications, but that might start to be difficult because if you want to look at a bunch of bank apps, now you need accounts with all those banks, and now it just got a lot more complicated. Uh, it'll be interesting to see some other surveys. Like I said, general service security issues, uh, log leakage of information, uh, good you know, analytics reporting, uh, and even cloud storage. When a lot of things are using uh, AWS and, and stuff like that. How secure is the connection back to there? Are your credentials being duplicated there in an unsafe way? And even just coming up with more detailed best practices recommendations would be kind of a neat thing to see. So that's pretty much it. If there's any questions, Otherwise, thank you very much. Oh, I got one back here. Did you consider or notice anything with regards to network copying, such that if the system moved from one network address to another, that it would free from authentication? The question is, did I notice anything with network copying so that if it's moving from one network to another, it would reprompt me? So if I've established a connection with one IP address, and then I establish a new connection, and all of a sudden I'm talking to a different server. Did it react? I didn't test for that. That's an interesting idea, though. Over here. Uh, because Snoopit is able to bypass some of your pinning, yes. do you have any uh, suggestions for how to properly implement pinning that can be automatically bypassed by a tool? Are there suggestions for preventing bypassing of pinning by tools? There, there are. I, don't have them right off the top of my head. And realistically, to do that, you're going to need to be jailbreaking the device anyway. So somebody who's going after that at that level, they're going to be able to get past it anyway. Um, as long as you can't bypass it on an unprotected phone, I think you're probably OK. But there, there should be ways to do that. Any other questions? Yes. Did any application tell me any details about the bad cert that it saw? Nobody said, you saw, I don't know if you were here for the whole talk, there, I had a whole bunch of screens that just showed useless error messages. That's all I got. I got nothing that said, it's a bad cert, and by the way, it came from Johnny Hacker. Nothing, nothing like that. OK? Oh, one more. I, I can hear that. Say it again. where the credentials were stored on the device? Uh, was I using any tool to identify where the credentials were stored on the device? Uh, grep, <laughs> PLU tools. Um, I'm, I'm literally, I copied the whole sandbox onto my laptop. 
So I, I just did a tar, piped through SSH and dumped it on my device, on my laptop, extracted the tar file, and then I'm just doing a whole lot of wandering through the file system, peel dumps, uh, SQLite. I've got a couple of scripts that I use to dump the cache file out, and because because the cache files a lot of times are SQLite databases with just big hex blobs. So now I've got to dump that, decode the hex, see if there's anything in there. So some of it's some homegrown stuff. A lot of it is just standard Unix searching things. It, it could have been deeper. It probably should have been in a couple of cases. But I'm getting the bulk of, of the stuff. And with that, I think I have to stop. So again, thank you all very much.